a wide stretch of sea, deep and warm, and in the distance, a mysterious beckoning coastline. Sailors of ancient times steered their boats hesitantly towards this promised land. They came from Hellas, or more precisely from Chalcis, driven by desperate poverty to seek a new home. They were guided by flashes of fire spitting from a distant volcano, which, like an immense natural lighthouse, seemed to indicate the way. It was around the middle of the 8th century BC, and the place where these early invaders first landed was called Naxos, a secure, pleasant refuge where the history of Sicilian civilization was to begin. A rich and fascinating story which we shall tell by following the rise and fall of the many civilizations which have made this mythical island a place where art, culture and natural beauty are united in a rare, perhaps unique way. But let's get back to our colonists. Enough remains of ancient Naxos to tell us much about their way of life. They took advantage of the easy-going character of the local population and soon managed, chiefly through trade, to become wealthy and powerful, exploiting their more sophisticated civilization and the boundless fertility of the land. The city was destroyed in 403 BC by one of the many kings we shall come across on our journey, Dionysius I, the tyrant of another Greek colony destined to leave its mark on history, Syracuse. The first settlement by Corinthian colonists took place just about the same time as the foundation of Rome, around 734 BC, on a small island facing the city, Ortigia. Legend has it that it was the Delphic Oracle itself that sent them there, with a promise of glory and riches. At any rate, one of the first temples was built in honour of Apollo, and we can see what a splendid one it was by looking at its reconstruction in the town's museum. In fact, the reasons for the choice were much more practical. It was a very agreeable spot, easily defendable, and possessing an inexhaustible spring, the present-day Fountain of Arethusa. The fertility of the place is substantiated even today by the fact that this is the only spot outside Egypt where the papyrus plant grows wild. It springs up copiously on the banks of the river Chani, and a museum has been dedicated to it, where parchment is made using the same techniques as those of the Egyptians 3,000 years before. This reconstruction, also exhibited in the Archaeological Museum, allows us to admire the most important sacred building of the island, the Temple of Athena, built by Galon in the 5th century BC. The temple was later converted into an early Christian church, and today vestiges of it can still be seen embedded in the structure of the cathedral. With the increase of its prosperity, the city extended onto the mainland, and the rate of its expansion can be gauged by the fact that already in the 5th century it possessed one of the largest, most spectacular theatres ever built. The Greek theatre at Syracuse, still very much in use today, could hold over 15,000 spectators, and was the heart of the city's cultural life. To meet the ever-growing need for housing, the quarries, the so-called Lautumie, were brought into use. One, a grotto with an ear-shaped channel, was also used as a prison. It was the 17th century painter Caravaggio who spread the rumour that the place's exceptional acoustic properties had been exploited by the tyrant Dionysius to eavesdrop on the conversations of his prison. 
This is surely only a legend, but there is no doubt that it was used to amplify the already exceptional acoustics of the theatre above. But the power attained by the city was helpless before the might of Rome. Not even the walls of the massive Euryalus castle, believed to be unbreachable, nor the famous burning glass of Archimedes could halt the legions. The Romans besieged the city in 213 BC and, as was their habit, put it to fire and sword, killing even the great mathematical genius himself. A remnant from that period is the huge amphitheatre, used, again according to Roman practice, more for bloody gladiatorial games than for masterpieces of Greek drama. We were talking of the Romans. Their eye fell on another Syracusan colony on the north coast of the island, Tyndaris, founded, again by Dionysius I, in 396 BC. But here the inhabitants had the sense to realise the strength of the new invaders and to offer no resistance. On the contrary, they formed an alliance, thereby avoiding the destruction of their city, whose ruins consequently remind us of how it must have been at its period of greatest splendour. Here then is what is left of houses and the thermal baths, decorated with fine mosaics, among them the image of the Trinacri, the ancient name of the island, which has now become the symbol of Sicily. The fine theatre is, as usual, superbly positioned, with the sea in the background. While the basilica, intended for public assemblies and dating from the imperial era, is also impressive. Today, Tindaris is dominated by another important place of cult worship, the Sanctuary of the Black Madonna, built in imitation of an ancient building destroyed in the 16th century by the Algerian pirate Barbarossa. But to get back to our early colonizers, not far from Syracuse, we can admire the ruins of the very ancient Megara Hiblea, founded, as we have seen, at the same time as Naxos in the 7th century BC. The place had been a prominent trading center, especially because of the manufacture of polychrome ceramics, an activity which still today, especially at Caltagirone and Santo Stefano di Camastra, is one of the island's most important handcraft activities. Its commercial success allowed Megara to extend its territories and found new colonies. One of these was destined to become a place of exceptional importance, Selinunte. It was the last Greek colony to the west, as it bordered on the barbaric territories of the Elimians, of whom we shall speak later, a fact which made the three centuries of its existence extremely stormy ones. To live in relative peace, the city had to make an alliance with the Carthaginians, its natural enemies, who dominated the western part of Sicily. 
Over the years, it was enriched with such a large amount of temples that it was considered for a long time to be one of the most splendid cities of its era. Even today, archaeologists who have resorted to the letters of the alphabet to list them have already reached the letter O. Selinunte's natural enemy was suggested, worried by and envious of the commercial success of its rival. And it was indeed the struggle with Segesta which brought about Selinunte's end. Its opponents called in the aid of the Carthaginians, who, by an act of treachery by no means unique in human history, betrayed their former allies, laid siege to the city, and razed it to the ground, committing a fearful massacre, over 16,000 dead and more than 5,000 prisoners. The wonderful city of the temples ceased to exist. Greek revenge was not slow in arriving, and grim days were also in store for the treacherous Segesta. The city, spread over the slopes of Mount Barbaro, enjoyed a magnificent position, as can be seen from its theatre, with an auditorium over 60 metres in diameter, looking out over an incomparable panorama. Segesta was one of the most important towns of the Elimians a people originating, or so it seems, with Trojan exiles who came to Sicily at the end of the second millennium BC. Their alliance with the Carthaginians was not forgiven by the Greeks, and especially the Syracusans, who, under the leadership of Agathocles, successfully besieged and destroyed it in 306 BC. Apart from the theatre, there is another beautifully preserved monument to admire, the temple built in Doric style in the 5th century BC. In fact, it is not so much a conventional temple as a great sacred enclosure, roofless beneath an open sky and suited to the religious needs of the people who built it. The Greeks had already wreaked vengeance on the hated Carthaginians a century and a half earlier, at a place further north, Himea. Here, a coalition between Syracuse and Agrigentum defeated a Carthaginian army of over 300,000 men under Hamilcar. The island had been spared any further enemy expansion for several decades. The ruins we are looking at now belong to the Temple of Victory, built in Doric style ten years after the battle, where joyful Thanksgiving celebrations must surely have taken place. Another festival spirit welcomes us near another great temple. We are at Agrigent, watching a performance which is part of the Almond Blossom Festival, one of the most important of its kind in Sicily. Folk groups come from all over the world to participate in this celebration by the local inhabitants of the beauty of their land and its wonderful year-round climate. This joie de vivre has been described by many well-known writers of the past who have portrayed the town as a place of great beauty and exceptional environmental attraction. Luigi Pirandello, a playwright who was born and is buried here, used to remind his listeners that the ancient Acragantines used to eat each day as though they were going to die the next and build houses and temples as though they were never going to die at all. A visit to the Valley of the Temples is a true plunge back into history. The Temple of Concord alone would be enough to bear this out. It was begun in 440 BC 
and with its solemn elegance and the harmony of its proportions, is undoubtedly one of the greatest examples of Greek architecture. It owes its name to an inscription from Roman times dedicated to the concord of the population, and its exceptional state of preservation to its conversion, which lasted till the middle of the 18th century, into a Christian church. To the east is the temple of Juno Lessini. It was used for the celebration of marriages, and there is a curious story told by the elder Pliny attached to it. The town had commissioned from the painter, Zeuxis, a painting which would depict Juno, symbol of female beauty. The painter accepted on the condition that a hundred maidens would file past him naked to enable him to choose the ideal model. Apparently, the local girls practically came to blows to compete for the honour, and with justification, as the resulting painting became so famous that the artist himself had to impose an entrance fee to limit the amount of visitors. The Doric Temple of Hercules was the oldest of all. It dates back to the end of the 6th century BC, and its dedication to the invincible hero can be verified by a quotation from the famous oration of Cicero against Verres, who was found guilty of the theft of a statue of Hercules made by the sculptor Miro. The immense scale of the original construction is demonstrated by this copy of an atlas one of the huge statues, about eight meters tall, which supported the epistyle of the Temple of Olympian Zeus, which seems to have been about the size of a football field. Here we see the reconstituted original of another giant in the museum. And finally, the ruins of the most famous temple, that of Castor and Pollux, which, although offering us today only four columns, reconstructed, what's more, at the beginning of the 19th century, has become one of the symbols of Agrigentum and Sicily itself. Another of the joys of Agrigentum is its sea and nowhere can it be better appreciated in all its translucent freshness than in an island which is reached from here, Lampedusa. The island is part of the continental platform of Africa and is not made of volcanic rock. There are even those who think of it not as the southernmost extremity of Italy, but the northernmost tip of Africa. Once green and fertile, it was deforested by its inhabitants during the last century and is now arid and wild. This, along with the endless expanse of blue sea which surrounds it, makes it a very special place. Absolutely not suitable for those looking for a luxurious social life, it has unforgettable moments to offer to anyone, especially underwater baths, who want to live a simple sea life. A place for relaxation sun, sea, and lots of fish. 
But for those who can never have enough of history and culture, here are some more sensational discoveries. We are at Morgantina, yet another Greek colony founded in the 6th century BC. The site was discovered in 1955 by an American team from the University of Princeton, and after many years of excavation, fascinating remains were brought to light. To judge by the many monuments we are able to admire, Morgantina must have been a place of great splendor. Large, tranquil, with particularly hospitable inhabitants, as can be seen from this greeting built in mosaic at the entrance to a house which welcomes the visitor with the admonition, be well. They seem to lack for nothing. There was a huge agora on two floors linked by a wide staircase. Comfortable houses, a 90 meter long gymnasium for sporting activities, and a theater capable of holding 5,000 spectators, among which must surely have been Eskimos, who lived nearby in what is today Jane. The polychrome mosaic pavements which decorate many of the houses indicate a wealthy, cultured society, as in this one depicting Ganymede, the beautiful boy who was whisked away by Zeus to become his cupbearer. Even more magnificent mosaics await us just a few kilometers away at Piazza Armerina, where can be found one of the most interesting archaeological discoveries in Sicily of the Roman imperial era. This is the villa of Maximian Herculeus, built between the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 5th centuries AD, a unique witness to the splendor reached by Roman art and architecture. truly luxurious dwelling, the spacious villa is laid out in three large groups of rooms. One doesn't know which to admire more, the boldness of the design or the skill of the execution. Especially extraordinary are the great ornamental and figurative mosaics, which are everywhere to be seen, stretching over an extension of 3,500 square meters. Here we can safely say that nothing quite like it has been handed down to us from ancient times huge hunting scenes, amazingly lifelike portrayals of every kind of animal, mythological scenes, even the owner and his wife greeting guests at the entrance to the house. And finally, the most famous scene of all. Ten young girls playing happily together, dressed in the scantiest of costumes, the millennial predecessors of our bikinis. Fashion hasn't changed that much. What could be the descendants of those girls in equally daring attire throng the beaches of the many islands which helped to make Sicily a summer paradise. These are the most famous of all, the Aeolian Islands, seven rocky volcanic sisters emerging from the fathoms deep blue of the sea.
Here we are in Lipari, the archipelago's capital, which still bears traces of its illustrious past. In 4000 BC, the island was one of the most flourishing in the Mediterranean because it supplied obsidian, a volcanic mineral whose sharp edge was invaluable for the making of arrows and lances. Over the centuries, the island acquired an acropolis and also a powerful fleet with which the inhabitants managed to put to flight the ruthless pirates who infested the Mediterranean. It is well worthwhile visiting Lipari's archaeological museum, which contains many valuable discoveries from all over the archipelago. Today, the islands are simply an enchanting place for a summer holiday. Apart from Lipari, you can choose between the peace of Salina, the social life of Panarea, the excitement of living at Stromboli on an active volcano, or the wild beauty of Alicudi and Filicudi. And finally, there's Vulcan, dominated by its seemingly spent crater which in fact still has a darkly powerful, fascinating but scary underground life of its own. But on the other side of the island, the most majestic volcano of all awaits us. Today, as it was for voyagers thousands of years ago, Etna is an essential point of reference for the whole island. It is the largest volcano in Europe, and a visit to its slopes reveals a fascinating world. Wild and inhospitable on one side, it explodes with life and colour on the other, a life reborn from death in the protected area which makes up the Etna Park. winter, you can ski comfortably down well-equipped slopes with the sea in front of you and behind you the warm breath of the, at least in this case, friendly volcano. But he was far from friendly on the night of the 28th of December 1908 when Messina was hit by one of the most violent earthquakes of recent centuries. A few seconds of the fury of nature and the city was reduced to rubble. It was a terrible catastrophe, causing over 60,000 victims, but it didn't break the courage of its people, who set out to rebuild an even more splendid city than before.
Today, Messina, the first sight of Sicily for those crossing the straits from the mainland, is a beautiful town. This is the fine Neo-Norman Cathedral, alongside which the high, slender bell tower contains one of the largest and most complex clocks in the world. Built in Strasbourg in the 30s from a design by the architect Francesco Valenti, the mechanism is enough to take your breath away. Messina is a perfect base from which to visit the east coast of the island. We go down to Aci Castello, a small fishing village which takes its name from the Norman castle which towers above it. Close by is Aci Trezza, known to Italians as the setting for a famous novel by the Sicilian writer Giovanni Verga. The view from the village, which is a favorite seaside resort, takes in the Cyclops rocks. So called because legend has it, they were the boulders Polyphemus hurled after Ulysses in revenge for having been blinded by him. Aci Reale, a well-known thermal spa, is also well worth a visit, especially for its fine churches, like the cathedral and the church of Saints Peter and Paul. also take a restful stroll in the Villa Belvedere, a lovely public park from which there are splendid views along the coast and towards Etna. A little further north, still at the feet of Mount Etna, we come to Isola Bella a lovely part of the coast from which one can climb to one of the most famous places in Sicily, Taormina. Set in a wonderful position on the slopes of Mount Tauro, you can wander down charming little streets packed with shops and boutiques of all kinds and then visit, for instance, the Corvaia Palace, seat in 1411 of the first Sicilian parliament. Or the Church of St. Catherine. Or the Cathedral built in the early 13th century and dedicated to St. Nicholas. But it is, above all, the famous Greek theatre, situated halfway up the cliff with a stupendous view that attracts virtually everyone who visits Sicily. Second in size only to that of Syracuse, this magnificent monument is perhaps the most perfect symbol of the history, the beauty and the art of this island. In 1693, a terrible earthquake raised to the ground what had previously been an ordinary provincial town, Noto. But here too, the inhabitants refused to be crushed and set out to rebuild their town according to new architectural standards. And so the new Noto was born, and dozens of palaces, churches and monasteries rose up which have made it one of the most famous Baroque towns in the world. 
Here is the cathedral dedicated to St. Nicholas of Mir. The Church of St. Francis, alongside a former Franciscan monastery and the Benedictine Monastery of the Saviour. And then ever more palaces, balconies, streets, stucco and ironwork decoration, all designed to arouse admiration and surely envy. Perhaps the most flamboyant of all are the balconies of the Villa Dorata Palace, whose bulging shape was intended to accommodate, without crushing, the ample skirts of the noble ladies leaning over. An unusually ostentatious symbol of wealth. In a nearby little town, Mordica, we can admire another fine 18th century monument, the Church of St. George. Built in the 12th century, it was restored 500 years later according to the prevailing aesthetic standards, and now stands as one of Sicily's finest examples of Baroque. And lastly, Ragusa, where we can admire another splendid Baroque cathedral, again dedicated to St. George. change of epochs and back to the sea. If it hadn't been for its cathedral, Cefalu would probably have stayed a pleasant, little-known Sicilian town. But the fame which the great Norman church has brought it has made it one of the most visited and most socially active places on the island. summer, it is thronged with young people determined to make the most of the carefree holiday atmosphere. Meanwhile, the old cathedral continues patiently to look down, as it has for 800 years, on the history flowing by beneath it. King Roger II founded it in 1131 in gratitude for having miraculously survived a storm at sea. And between a swim, an ice cream and a drink, the tourists come to visit it inevitably impressed by the vast interior, the fine mosaics, and the severe stare of Christ Pantocrator, seeming from the height of the presbytery to counsel moderation. Then evening comes, and the balmy air tempts tourists, both local and foreign, to more earthly pleasures. Few can resist the temptation to indulge abundantly in some of the most tasty dishes in the world. And for the time being, who remembers the Normans and moderation?
but there is another church whose fame surpasses even that of Cefalu. We move over west to Monreal, a pleasant little town just outside Palermo, which is literally dominated by its gigantic cathedral. Founded by King William II in 1174, and one of Christianity's most spectacular buildings. The visitor cannot fail to be dazzled by this extraordinary example of medieval art, in which Byzantine, Arab and Norman elements blend in perfect harmony. The Porta Regum, or King's Door, at the entrance, is a fine work of 1186 by Bonanno Pisano, the architect who, a few years earlier, had begun building the Tower of Pisa. The astonishingly beautiful interior is decorated with the most complete cycle of Byzantine mosaics we possess. They cover every inch of the walls and tell the stories of the Old and New Testaments in scenes of startling originality and power. No less beautiful is the cloister of the adjoining Benedictine monastery. A perfect square, each side 47 meters long, it is a wonderful example of Sicilian Romanesque. There are 228 twin columns, each one different, encrusted with gold and decorated with mosaics and precious stones, finely worked in bas-relief. Outside the cathedral, a brightly coloured cart a typical piece of Sicilian folklore reminds us of the medieval stories of the great Norman king. These warrior adventurers came down from the north in their hordes into Byzantine Italy and before long had subjugated the southern part of the peninsula. Their landing in Sicily in the second half of the 11th century was looked on as a mini crusade aimed at driving out the Arabs who for two centuries had dominated the island and their heroic deeds inspired the stories sung by Sicilian bards and still represented in the famous puppet theatre. <laughs> Io voglio Angelica a tutti i costi. Anch'io. Angelica è mia. No, è mia. We end our journey of discovery through Sicily at its most important city, Palermo, where many of the historical threads we have examined come together. The city seems to have been founded around the 7th century BC by the Phoenicians, who made it, along with Motia and Solunto, one of their main strongholds on the island they were seeking to conquer. In following centuries, it fell into many hands, all of which contributed to its rich artistic heritage. Today, we can admire monuments of many different periods and styles, Byzantine, Arab, Norman, and Baroque. 
But the many foreign conquests never completely tamed the proud, rebellious character of the people who cleverly blunted the sharp edges of the inevitable cultural shocks, absorbing them and integrating them into an architectural and artistic unity, which is what we see in this fascinating city today. Many of its legendary kings, including the great emperor Frederick II, are buried in the majestic cathedral, built by the English archbishop Walter of the Mill on the site of a 9th century basilica which had been turned into a mosque by the Saracens and consecrated in 1185. Despite its patchwork nature, the church is one of the finest sites of the city. The 14th to 15th century facade contains a Gothic doorway flanked by two slender towers. A wide portico on the right side provides another entrance through a magnificent doorway. Another symbol of the city is the palace of the Norman kings, built in the 9th century during the Arab domination. It was the seat of the Norman and Swabian kings, under whom it became for a while the most important cultural center in Europe. Today, it houses the Sicilian Regional Assembly. The interior is decorated with frescoes by major artists. This is the yellow room. the room of the viceroy. The rooms of King Roger II with wonderful Arab decorated ceilings. Tower of the Winds. The Palatine Chapel is perhaps the most typical example of Norman art.
Built by Roger II between 1132 and 1140, its walls are covered with mosaics in the Byzantine tradition, a dazzling sequence of colors and images illustrating stories from the life of Christ, the Old Testament and Saints Peter and Paul, and finally the stupendous Christ Pantocrator, solemn and majestic, dominating the whole chapel. Nearby is the Norman church of San Giovanni degli Eremiti, or St. John of the Hermits. Founded as early as 581, the church was entrusted by St. Gregory the Great to the Benedictine order and possesses a beautiful cloister, an unusual feature of which is the luxuriant growth of exotic plants. In the fine Piazza Pretoria, we find the Palazzo Senatorio and the Baroque Church of St. Catherine. But the greatest attraction of the square is the beautiful fountain, a 16th century work of the Florentine sculptor Francesco Camigliani, adorned with a great many allegorical and mythical statues. Close by is Piazza Villena, commonly known as Piazza Quattro Canti, of the square of the four corners from the statues which stand at the corners of the square and represent the kings of Spain, the seasons, and the patron saints of the town. Another Norman church, Santa Maria del Amiraglio, also known as the Martoran. The fine interior is decorated with some of the most ancient Byzantine mosaics in Sicily. preserved remains of the Bridge of the Amiraglio, with its seven arches, reveal the advanced scientific and cultural level attained in Norman Sicily. Yet another couple of Norman churches. The Magione, and St. John of the Lepers, perhaps the oldest Norman church in Palermo. Another fine example of Norman architecture is the castle of Ziza, which derives its name from the Arab word Aziz, meaning splendid. Building was begun by King William I halfway through the 12th century, the castle being part of a huge royal park full of important Arab monuments.
One of the most interesting examples of Baroque art in Palermo is the 17th century Church of St. Stephen, situated in the busy Calza district. The imposing facade of the church of St. Dominic in the square of the same name is also Baroque. Our journey around the history, beauty and art of Sicily ends here with the sea, which has been the life and soul of this island throughout all the many centuries of its history. We can admire the last series of beauty spots right here near Palermo. Mondello, Scopello, Castellamare del Golfo, San Vito lo Capo, and Isola delle Femmine. All enchanting places which live up to Sicily's great tradition of tourism. This island, after three millennia of history, still offers a proud but welcoming face to all visitors who come, not with violence as so often in the past, but with love. Here they can re-experience the art and culture of all the civilizations which have passed through it, at the same time relaxing in its gentle but stimulating climate. Of all the intoxicating emotions they will take away with them, perhaps the strongest will be the wish to return. <laughs>